otherwise, the first is going to also going to be up on the screen, uh, and you can read as well. So the Bible reading from today is going to be for from Romans chapter five, verse twelve to uh, twenty-one. So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds or a minute to flick through these pages. And for those who is using this kind of Bible, um, it's in page five hundred and thirteen. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sin. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm. Thanks, Becca. Now let me pray for us. Father, we've just heard your word. May we listen. May it speak to us of your amazing, abundant grace. So it be full of joy through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. My name's Josh. I'm the lead pastor of Laneway Church. Uh, welcome, especially to the mums. Welcome today. Now, I want you to use your imagination now. Uh, picture a, a room in your house your favourite room, uh, a room, and if you don't have one, you just dream it up, right? And in your room, there's two chairs, and one of those chairs has the best spot. It's the spot by the window, and the sunlight comes in. And there's your room. Now picture yourself uh, in this room. There's the, you are there, and your child is there. Uh, you might have to imagine this. Uh, your child. <coughs> your child has grown up, they're a teenager, and you and your child love to sit together in this room under the window in the sun. But your child goes through the lowest lows. Uh, your child goes off with her friends as she grows up. Uh, you know this, that she's anxious. You know that she really wants to be liked. She starts getting into riskier and riskier things. And as this happens and goes on more and more, she stops talking to you. And you notice that she stops eating well. And after she goes out and comes back, her clothes start to smell. Yeah, but you know it's not cigarettes. And uh, as you sit in that room, and it's becoming less and less frequent, uh, you notice that it doesn't matter what the weather is outside, she's always wearing long sleeves. And she won't look you in the eye 
and she won't stop picking at the skin around her nails. And even though you reach out, nothing really changes. You ground her, nothing changes. You let her go, nothing changes. You yell at her, you hug her, nothing changes. You send her friends away and so you can't see them anymore. You invite her friends in, stay at our house, nothing changes. And then one day you come home and it's been some time. The last time you were together sitting there in that room and, and you were in your chair and she was in her chair, you never even made eye contact and the light that came through the window was just grey. But this morning you walk in and you find her and she's sitting there in the chair. And today the sun is coming in through the window. And she's sitting there in a t-shirt. And she looks at you. And you notice that she's calm. More than that. She's happy. She, she looks really alive. Like you haven't seen her like this for so long. Really alive. And so you sit down in your chair next to her in her chair. And you lean in and she begins to tell you the most amazing story. A story of overwhelming kindness that's rescued her, that's made her alive again. Now, if you're a visiting mum here today, I want to explain to you that story. I want to tell you that story. I want you to know what this great and powerful and overwhelming kindness is so that you can rejoice. Because if you're here today, because your, your daughter, your son is a Christian, they've brought you along. They want you to know, they want to lean in with you and they want to share this with you about the overwhelming, powerful kindness of God. <coughs> so that you can rejoice for them and not only that, so that you can then sit in that chair too and share it with them. Now, to help us understand this, we have to see the down. We have, we have to know that they're going to, in this story, imagine they're going to tell us the bad part, right? We're going to hear where it all went wrong. We're going to hear why it was so bad. But then see this overwhelming, amazing kindness. So I'd love you to have your Bibles open because the passage we just read takes us into God's view of the badness, the down, the dark, the damage, all of it. And it starts with the reign and sin of sin and death through Adam. Now, if you're coming in, reading the Bible for the first time, this might sound quite strange to you. We started our church service today reading from the very start of the Bible. And you might be thinking, I don't really know what's happening. I don't really know who these people are. I don't, I don't know what to do here. Um, I think it's, as you approach reading the Bible, it's a little bit like learning to eat the food from another culture and use their utensils. Like, I grew up uh, mid-North Coast, New South Wales. I didn't hold a chopstick until I moved to Newcastle. Um, couldn't use it. Like, I'd sit down to eat rice, and I'd just be like, trying to use my knife and my fork. And if you've, yeah, that's not how you eat, that's not how you eat good rice, is it? Also, if, if you're sitting down at my place with, like, a, you know, steak and three veg, chopsticks won't get you very far. You know, you come to the Bible, this might feel different, it might feel unfamiliar. Just try listening along, get used to it. Get used to it. Don't give up too quickly. Uh, learn to use the chopsticks. Learn to use the knife and fork. Because otherwise you might miss out on an unforgettable meal. So what's happening here? Well, the bad thing that happens at the start of this story doesn't start with something we did, but with something someone else did. So you open your Bible, Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Here's the entrance into this story. In these words, the Apostle Paul, a follower of Jesus, he's writing to the church in Rome and he takes them back to the very beginning, the first man, the start of humanity. The man whose name is Adam. And here we see how sin enters our world. So to kind of tell it to you briefly, God 
makes the world. He makes this good, beautiful, abundant world and makes Adam in this world to bear his image and rule over the world as his representative. I think that's my phone going off. How about that? You see where it all went wrong straight away, don't you? Uh, With Adam, God makes Eve, uh, both together in the likeness of God, and he gives them a provision and a limit. He places them in this beautiful garden for them to tend it and bring it to flourish. And in that garden, he puts two trees that represent a provision and a limit. One tree is called the tree of life, that they could eat the fruit of and live forever. Here God provides for them this possibility of eternal life with him, to be received dependently from his hand. And then he gives them a second tree and commands them to not eat from it. And this tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. To take and to eat from this tree was to make yourself to be like God, to know good and evil for yourself apart from him. And so this second tree is forbidden. To eat from it is to cast aside the God who gives life and the consequence is to die. And that's what Adam does. He eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He breaks God's express command, do not eat from the tree, and chooses to be free from God and so he's cursed to die. He's cut off from the tree of life and he goes on to face God's final judgment after his death. And so, sin enters the world. And Paul says, death then comes through sin. So verse 12, death through sin. Now, death is not merely the thing that happens to us, is it? It's it's not just the tragic thing at the end of 80 years, 90 years or sooner. Death we see here is the punishment of God, that God who is the lawgiver and judge. And it's the consequence of sin. Because it's the choice to say to God, look, I know you're the God who gives life, but I'm going to live apart from you. I'm going to do it my way. So it's both punishment and sin. And it helps us understand, doesn't it, why death feels both so natural and so wrong at the same time. Natural and wrong. Of course, death's natural. Like We all know, no one walked in this morning thinking, oh yeah, I'm not going to die. I'm, no one else is going to die. No, we, we know, don't we? We must die. Everything must die. It's just normal. It's baked into the fabric of the world. And so because we know that, we can go, well, what is there to get upset about? Should we just kind of face this bravely and just soldier on? Just make the most of now? It's so natural, right? But it's also so wrong. It's not right. It's it's horrid, it's, it's this awful consequence of a world in which sin has entered into and we've fallen under the curse of God where we must live apart from him and die. It's judgment. And so we grieve death. We fear death and we fear what happens after, even if we have no idea what it actually is. Now Sarah, my wife, works as a GP and she said that the great fear that underlies so many of the consults It's not the cough that brought the person in. It's not the medication that they're needing to try. Underneath it all, the greater, deeper fear is this. It's the fear of death. So sin enters the world through Adam. Death through sin. But the entrance of death, it's not just pictured. uh, It's not just consequence. It's not just punishment. It's the entrance of a great power. So verse 14, Paul says that nevertheless death reigned. Or again in verse 17, by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man. So death's not just turning up at the end of life, right? It's, it's not like death is just sort of uh, a bad knock-knock joke where you can see the punchline coming. Right, let's try this for a second. Oh, I'll do it for you. Uh, knock-knock. Who's there? Death. Death who? Your death. Right? It's, what an appalling, terrible knock knock joke. Is that the worst joke you've ever heard? I wrote it myself. Didn't even need my kids for that one. This like inevitability, this awful punchline. It's 
You can see it coming a mile off when you think about it. Not funny. You don't want to really hear it. I mean, we often think death's like that. It's just this, oh my gosh, it's kind of building up to it. It's going to happen, isn't it? Oh, and it's finally here. And it's awful, and you, you hated it. But it's not just, death is not just that, right? It's not just the punchline of life. It's a power. It's a power. It reigns over us, the Bible says. Like a king. Now, I had the sense that um, for many Aussies, watching King Charles be crowned was not super different, really, to watching Eurovision this weekend. I mean, like, there's the crazy clothes, there's the music with the languages you don't understand, there's key changes, everyone's dressed up, there's thousands of fans, there's complicated stories about you know, the feelings of certain members of the band, and uh, it's, this is one big show, right? And we kind of go, well, it's great that we have this king, but, and, and I suppose he reigns, but if he ever actually did anything that would affect my life, well, let's get that referendum going again after all. We go, thanks, but no thanks. But death is not that kind of a king. It's not that kind of a reign, is it? Uh, death reigns with power. It's the ticking clock of a countdown timer with numbers that you can't see. It's the pressure in our ears. It's the sudden fear as you fall asleep. It's that relentless thrum to squeeze more out of life before it's up. It's the real worry behind seeing the doctor. It rains. We are affected. And so, Paul says, death came to all people because all sinned. Verse 12. Death came to all people because all sinned. Now, Paul here is not saying that we just copy what Adam did. That Adam sinned, we also sin, and so we too die. Though that's true. That's true. And he's not saying that Adam sinned, we've inherited a corrupted nature from Adam, and so, like him, we then go on and sin, and so we die. Though that's true as well. He's not saying either of those. So his point is much more immediate. He's saying that when Adam sinned, he did so as the one representative man of humanity. So that when he sinned, we sinned in him. And since he sinned as our representative, we're all counted guilty immediately. We're condemned by his action. In his sin, all sin and all die. This is the point that Paul makes in his parallel verses 18 and 19. Have a look down, verse 18. He says, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. It's an immediate thing. One trespass results in immediate condemnation for all people. And the parallel to Jesus, which we're coming to, shows us that's the case. Similarly, in verse 19, the idea of being made sinners through Adam's disobedience, it's not that we're transformed and corrupted in our nature, but that we've entered into this new state, this new position. And we took on the position and state of being sinners through Adam. Like, uh, if your dad goes to the footy and signs your family up as members of Carlton, now you've all been made sinners. I mean, you've been made members. Yeah, or, or if, uh, you know, Vanguard, our Australian entrant in the Eurovision this year, uh, this Perth band, if they happen to win Eurovision, then Australia wins, because we win in them, right? Adam acts as our representative head. He's the first man, and when he sins, all humanity sin in him. When he's condemned, we're condemned in him. We're guilty in him. Immediately. He did it for us. And what's the impact of this? It, well, it means that death reigns over all of us. When he was sentenced to die, death entered into the world to reign over all of us. And it doesn't matter whether you knew what was happening like Adam. It doesn't matter whether you had the Bible. It doesn't matter whether you knew what God had said. It doesn't matter if you'd read it. You see, he goes on to say, even over the people from between Adam 
and Moses who received the law, the Ten Commandments. All those people, right? Death reigned over them as well. Verse 13, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin's not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam. We're under the reign of death. Now, this could be hard to accept. It's there. Has it impacted my life? How am I supposed to think about myself? But I think it really explains so much. Who am I? Where do I stand before God? Why is it that sin is inevitable in my life? and that I know I will die. It's because of what has happened for us in Adam. When we were away this week at uh, the Reach Australia Conference with our church leadership team, there was a conversation happening, what would you be doing if you weren't a Christian? What would you be doing if you weren't a Christian? Now, two members of our leadership team just looked at us and said, I would be in jail. Now, you can work out which ones they were. I thought, where would I be without Christ? I thought, I'd probably be a professional basketball coach. That's what I'd be doing. I'd be be super hardworking, super competitive, driving on these other players to be as good as they could be. I think my life would be lived on the tipping point of anger. There's that that drive of, you know, kind of pride, desire for greatness, love of appreciation, wanting to be really good at stuff, wanting to win through others, wanting to make some money, but I wouldn't be obsessed. but if you met me, right, I'd be a decent guy, I think. I'd be nice to my friends. I'd probably be pretty self-absorbed. I'd be distant from my parents, but I'd be willing to look after them. I wouldn't be in jail. Not Juan. Sorry, Juan. <laughs> There's another person too. You've got to work out who it was. I, but I wouldn't be any different to Quan or our other jailbird. No, no, I too would be just as guilty in Adam, just as much a sinner in Adam, just as much living apart from God, just as much lost, just as much condemned, just as much under the reign of death, just as helpless, just as powerless, no better. See, the problem with our story at the start is we might picture ourselves, the child. You know, we may think that... that you know, this descent into sin and guilt and death, it's, it's just about the users, it's just about the crims, it's just about our church staff team. It's not. You know, it's about all of us. Whether we think ourselves average, above average, below average, it's all of us. It's, it's me. It's your children. It's your parents. It's you. Because it's all of us in Adam. Now, once you grasp that, that reality, to then hear from God the overwhelming good news, the good news that makes you want to lean in and see the smile and hear about this new life. Because the last thing we read in this verse, verse 14, is that this Adam, who by his actions changes the life and destiny of all, he is actually a pattern of one to come another representative in heaven. And friends, this is the grace of God. The overwhelming grace of God. This great gift that overcomes the trespass. It's an extraordinary gift that God has given to us. Look down verse 15. See the gift that comes through the Lord Jesus. The gift is not like the trespass, For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more? 
or those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This gift turns a life around. It's overwhelming grace. That means the kindness of God. Not to give us what we deserve. Not to even not give us what we deserve, but to give us something we didn't deserve. Something far better indeed. And what is the gift? Well, this gift refers to Jesus. His act of obedience to die on the cross in the place of sinners. It's the gift we sang about in our third song. Jesus, God come to us, the Son of God, gave up his life, taking the punishment for our sin to make us right with God, to save us from God's future wrath through him. So that now in humanity, in history, there are two big men. There's Adam, all of us in him, and then for those who receive Jesus, a new humanity united to him. We are all in this one. So friends, you want to lean in and hear about what it means to be in Christ. Because it's overwhelming grace. Did you see how great this grace is? The three things pop up in this passage. Verse 15, the gift is not like the trespass. How is it not like it? Well, three ways. It's different in nature. One man's sin led to the death of many, but God's act is an act of grace. See, one's a matter of judgment, the other a matter of undeserved grace. Abounding grace, superior grace. It's different in nature, it's different in power. One act was enough to condemn, but grace overturns many acts that all condemn. Verse 16. It's different in future, verse 17. The reign of death is broken now and forever. See, through the trespass of this one man, Adam, death reigns, but how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? That reign of death is broken now and forever. You see, if you've come to Jesus, Your sin has been forgiven. You've gone from being guilty to counted righteous in God's sight. That's what we're justified in this passage. He accepts you. Thumbs up. And death has been beaten. So you're made alive now, alive to God in relationship with Him and you look forward to eternal life. You will reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ. Friends, this is a now and forever act of God. Now and forever. Paul concludes, verse 18, that this has happened for you right now. Verse 18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act, the work of Jesus Christ, resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's now and it's forever. If you are in Christ, you are righteous now, alive now, You will be, on that final day of God's judgment, you will be righteous then and you will enter into eternal life. That's the story. That's the story. I once was dead in sin, lost and hopeless. But I've been raised up with Christ. I'm forgiven. My guilt washed away. I'm alive with him. And my future, my future is secure. I will be righteous on that last day. I will live with God forever. Lean in. Lean in. This is the story, the good, good story. 
this is what Christ has done for you. Here's forgiveness. Here is justification. Here is life. If you're here and as uh, our friends up the front were sharing, it stirred up those feelings of guilt, the sense of failure, the sense of I've ruined my life, I've made a mess of things, I, I am that girl, I am that child, or I was the parent of that child and I think it's my fault. There is only one place you can turn, friends. But do you know what? It's the news for you that your sin is forgiven, your guilt is gone, 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 washed away, gone. You can smile. You really can. You can sing. You really can. God says it's gone because of Jesus. And you're alive. Your sin forever. Could you think of a greater thing to hope for for your children? A greater thing to want for your parents? Would there be anything more joyful, more wonderful that you could have than this? That death itself would be defeated. Sin washed away. Guilt gone. Friends, our band's going to come up. We're going to stand and sing with such joy of this good, good story. Let me pray as our band come up. Our Heavenly Father, you are so kind to us, giving us what we do not deserve. We thank you for our Lord Jesus, that for everyone who trusts in him, you've completely changed our standing given our sins, washed us clean, given us life. May we trust in him and be full of joy and lean in and share this with one another together. Amen.